Section 4 of The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anna Catherine Green. Section 4. Problem 4. The Grotto Spectre. Part 1. Miss Strange was not often pensive, at least not at large functions or when under the public eye, but she certainly forgot herself at Mrs. Provost's musicale, and that, too, without apparent reason. Had the music been of high order, one might have understood her abstraction, but it was of decidedly mediocre quality, and Violet's ear was much too fine and her musical sense too cultivated for her to be beguiled by anything less than the very best nor had she the excuse of a dull companion. Her escort for the evening was a man of unusual conversational powers, but she seemed to be almost oblivious of his presence. And when, through some passing courteous impulse, she did turn her ear his way, it was with just that tinge of preoccupation which betrays the divided mind. Were her thoughts with some secret problem yet unsolved? It would scarcely seem so from the gay remark with which she had left home. She was speaking to her brother, and her words were, I am going out to enjoy myself. I have not a care in the world. The slate is quite clean. Yet she had never seemed more out of tune with her surroundings, nor shown a mood further removed from trivial entertainment. What had happened to becloud her gaiety in the short time which, which had since elapsed? We can answer in a sentence. She had seen among a group of young men in a distant doorway, one with a face so individual and of an expression so extraordinary that all interest in the people about her had stopped, as a clock stops when the pendulum is held back. She could see nothing else, think of nothing else. Not that it was so very handsome, though no other had ever approached it in its power over her imagination, but because of its expression of haunting melancholy, a melancholy so settled and so evidently the result of long-continued sorrow that her interest had been reached, and her heartstrings shaken as never before in her whole life. She would never be the same violet again. Yet moved as she undoubtedly was, she was not conscious of the least desire to know who the young man was, or even to be made acquainted with his story. She simply wanted to dream her dream undisturbed. It was therefore with a sense of unwelcome shock that in the course of the reception, following the program, she perceived this fine young man approaching herself, with his right hand touching his left shoulder, in the peculiar way which committed her to an interview, with or without a formal introduction. Should she fly the ordeal, be blind and deaf to whatever was significant in his action, and go her way before he reached her, thus keeping her dream intact? Impossible. His eyes prevented that. His glance had caught hers, and she felt forced to await his advance, and give him her first spare moment. It came soon, and when it came she greeted him with a smile. It was the first she had ever bestowed in welcome of a confidence, of whose tenor she was entirely ignorant. To her relief, he showed his appreciation of the dazzling gift, though he made no effort to return it. Scorning all preliminaries in his eagerness to discharge himself of a burden, which was fast becoming intolerable, he addressed her at once in these words. You are very good, Miss Strange, to receive me in this unconventional fashion. I am in that desperate state of mind which precludes etiquette. Will you listen to my petition? I am told, you know by whom, and again he touched his shoulder, that you have resources of intelligence which especially fit you to meet the extraordinary difficulties of my position. May I beg you to exercise them on my behalf? No man would be more grateful if... But I see you do not recognize me. I am Roger Upjohn. That I am admitted to this gathering is owing to the fact that our hostess knew and loved my mother. In my anxiety to meet you and proffer my plea, I was willing to brave the cold looks you have probably noticed of the faces of the people about us. But I have no right to subject you to criticism. I remain. Violet's voice was troubled, her self-possession disturbed, but there was a command in her tone, which he was only too glad to obey. I know the name. Who did not? And possibly my duty to myself should make me shun a confidence which may burden me without relieving you. 
but you have been sent to me by one whose behests i feel bound to respect and mistrusting her voice she stopped the suffering which made itself apparent in the face before her appealed to her heart in a way to rob her of judgment she did not wish this to be seen and so fell silent he was quick to take advantage of her obvious embarrassment should i have been sent to you if i had first not secured the confidence of the sender you know the scandal attached to my name some of it just some of it very unjust if you will grant me an interview to-morrow i will make an endeavour to refute certain charges which i have hitherto let go unchallenged will you do me this favour will you listen in your own house to what i have to say instinct cried out against any such concession on her part bidding her beware of one who charmed without excellence and convinced without reason but compassion urged compliance and compassion won the day though conscious of weakness she violet strange on whom strong men had come to rely in critical hours calling for well-balanced judgment she did not let this concern her or allow herself to indulge in useless regrets even after the first effect of his presence had passed and she had succeeded in recalling the facts which had cast a cloud about his name roger upjohn was a widower and the scandal affecting him was connected with his wife's death though a degenerate in some respects lacking the domineering presence the strong mental qualities and inflexible character of his progenitors the wealthy massachusetts upjohns whose great place on the coast had a history as old as the state itself he yet had gifts and attractions of his own which would have made him a worthy representative of his race if only he had not fixed his affections on a woman so cold and heedless that she would have inspired universal aversion instead of love had she not been dowered with the beauty and physical fascination which sometimes accompany a hard heart and a scheming brain it was this beauty which had caught the lad and one day just as careful father had mapped out a course of study calculated to make a man of his son that son drove up to the gates with this lady whom he introduced as his wife the shock not of her beauty though that was of dazzling quality which catches a man in the throat and makes a slave of him while the first surprise lasts but of the overthrow of all of his hopes and plans nearly prostrated homer upjohn he saw as most men did the moment judgment returned that for all her satin skin and rosy flush the wonder of her hair and the smile which pierced like arrows and warmed like wine she was more likely to bring a curse into the house than a blessing and so it proved in less than a year the young husband had lost all his ambitions and many of his best impulses no longer inclined to study he spent his days in satisfying his wife's whims in his evenings in carousing with the friends with which she had provided him this in boston whither they had fled from the old gentleman's displeasure but after their little son came the father insisted upon their returning home which led to great deceptions and precipitated a tragedy no one ever understood they were natural gamblers this couple as all boston society knew and as homer upjohn loathed cards they found life slow in the great house and grew correspondingly restless till they made a discovery or shall i say rediscovery of the once famous grotto hidden in the rocks lining their portion of the coast here they found a retreat where they could hide themselves often when they were thought to be abed and asleep and play together for money or for a supper in the city or for anything else that foolish fancy suggested this was while their little son remained an infant later they were less easily satisfied both craved company excitement and gambling on a large scale so they took to inviting friends to meet them in this grotto which through the agency of one old servant devoted to roger to the point of folly had been fitted up and lighted in a manner not only comfortable but luxurious a small but sheltered haven hidden in the curve of the rocks made an approach by boat feasible at high tide and at low the connection could be made by means of a path over the promontory in which this grotto was concealed the fortune which roger had inherited from his mother made these excesses possible but many thousands let alone the few he could call his soon disappeared under the witchery of an irresponsible woman and the half-dozen friends who knew his secret had to stand by and see his ruin 
without daring to utter a word to the one who alone could stay it. For Homer Upjohn was not a man to be approached lightly, nor he was one to listen to charges without ocular proof to support them, and this called for courage, more courage than was possessed by any one who knew them both. He was a hard man, was Homer Upjohn, but with a heart of gold for those he loved. This, even his wary daughter-in-law, was wise enough to detect, and for a long while after the birth of her child she besieged him with her coaxing ways and bewitching graces. But he never changed his first opinion of her, and once she became fully convinced of the folly of her efforts, she gave up all attempts to please him, and showed an open indifference. This in time gradually extended till it embraced not only her child, but her husband as well. Yes, it had come to that. His love no longer contented her. Her vanity had grown by which it daily fed on, and now called for the admiration of the fast man, who sometimes came up from Boston to play with them in their unholy retreat. To win this, she dressed like some demon queen, or witch, though it drove her husband into deeper play, and threatened an exposure which would mean disaster not only to herself, but to the whole family. In all this, as any one could see, Roger had been her slave and the willing victim of all her caprices. What was it, then, which so completely changed him that a separation began to be talked of, and even its terms discussed? One rumor had it that the father had discovered the secret of the grotto, and exacted this as penalty from the son who had dishonored him. Another, that Roger himself was the one to take the initiative in this matter that on returning unexpectedly from New York one evening, and finding her missing from the house, he had traced her to the grotto, where he came upon her playing a desperate game with the man he had the greatest reason to distrust. But whatever the explanation of this sudden change in their relations, there is but little doubt that a legal separation between this ill-assorted couple was pending. When one bleak autumn morning she was discovered dead in her bed under the circumstances peculiarly open to comment. The physicians who made out the certificate ascribed her death to heart disease, symptoms of which had lately much alarmed the family doctor, but that a personal struggle of some kind had preceded the fatal attack was evident from the bruises which blackened her wrists. Had there been the like upon her throat, it might have gone hard with the young husband, who was known to be contemplating her dismissal from the house. But the discoloration of her wrist was all, and as bruised wrists do not kill— and there was besides no evidence forthcoming of the two having spent one moment together for at least ten hours preceding the tragedy, but rather full and satisfactory testimony to the contrary, the matter lapsed, and all criminal proceedings were avoided. But not the scandal, which always follows the unexplained. As time passed, and the peculiar look which betrays the haunted soul gradually became visible in the young widower's eyes, doubts arose, and reports circulated which cast strange reflections upon the tragic end of his mistaken marriage. Stories of the disreputable use to which the old grotto had been put were mingled with vague hints of conjugal violence, never properly investigated. The result was his general avoidance, not only by the social set dominated by his high-minded father, but of his own less reputable coterie, which, however lax in its moral code, had very little use for a coward. Such was the gossip which had reached Violet's ears in connection with this new client, prejudicing her altogether against him till she caught that beam of deep and concentrated suffering in his eye, and recognized an innocence which ensured her sympathy and led her to grant him the interview for which he so earnestly entreated. He came to her prompt to the hour, and when she saw him again with the marks of a sleepless night upon him, and all the signs of suffering intensified in his unusual countenance, she felt her heart sink within her, in a way she failed to understand. A dread of what she was about to hear robbed her of all semblance of self-possession, and she stood like one in a dream as he uttered his first greetings, and then paused to gather up his own moral strength before he began his story. When he did speak, it was to say, I find myself obliged to break a vow I've made to myself. You cannot understand my need unless I show you my heart. My trouble is not with the one with which men have credited me. It has another source, and is infinitely harder to bear. Personal dishonor I have deserved in a greater or lesser degree, but the trial 
which has come to me now involves a person more dear to me than myself, and this is totally without alleviation, unless you... He paused, choked, and then recommenced abruptly. My wife, Violet held her breath, was supposed to have died from heart disease, or, or some strange species of suicide. There were reasons for this conclusion, reasons which I accepted without serious question till some five weeks ago when I made a discovery which led me to fear. The broken sentence hung suspended. Violet, notwithstanding his hurried gesture, could not restrain herself from stealing a look at his face. It was set in horror and, though partially turned aside, made an appeal to her compassion to fill the void made by his silence, without further suggestion from him. She did this by saying tentatively, and with as little show of emotion as possible, You fear that the event called for vengeance, and that vengeance would mean increased suffering to yourself as well as to another. Yes, great suffering. But I may be under a most lamentable mistake. I am not sure of my conclusions. If my doubts have no real foundation, if they are simply the offspring of my own diseased imagination, what an insult to one I revere! What a horror of ingratitude and misunderstanding! Relate the facts, came in startled tones from Violet. They may enlighten us. He gave one quick shudder, buried his face for a moment in his hands, then lifted it and spoke up quickly and with unexpected firmness. I came here to do so, and do so I will. But where begin? Miss Strange, you cannot be ignorant of the circumstances, open and avowed, which attended my wife's death. But there were other and secret events in its connection which happily have been kept from the world, but which I must now disclose to you at any cost to my pride and so-called honor. This is the first one. On the morning preceding the day of Mrs. Upjohn's death, an interview took place between us at which my father was present. You do not know my father, Miss Strange. A strong man and a stern one, with a hold upon old traditions which nothing can shake. If he has a weakness, it is for my little boy Roger, in whose promising traits he sees the one hope which has survived the shipwreck of all for which our name has stood. Knowing this, and realizing what the child's presence in the house meant to his old age, I felt my heart turn sick with apprehension. When in the midst of the discussion as to the terms of which my wife would consent to a permanent separation, the little fellow came dancing into the room, his curls a toss and his whole face beaming with life and joy. She had not mentioned the child, but I knew her well enough to be sure that at the first show of preference on his part for either his grandfather or myself, she would raise a claim to him which she would never relinquish. I dared not speak, but I met his eager looks with my most foreboding frown and hoped by this show of severity to hold him back. But his little heart was full, and ignoring her outstretched arms, he bounded towards mine with his most affectionate cry. She saw and uttered her ultimatum. The child should go with her, or she would not consent to a separation. It was useless for us to talk. She had said her last word. The blow struck me hard, or so I thought, till I looked at my father. Never had I beheld such a change as that one moment had made in him. He stood as before. He faced us with the same silent reprobation, but his heart had run from him like water. It was a sight to call up all my resources, to allow her to remain now, with my feeling towards her all changed, and my father's eyes fully opened to her stony nature, was impossible. Nor could I appeal to law. An open scandal was my father's greatest dread, and divorce proceedings his horror. The child would have to go unless I could find a way to influence her through her own nature. I knew of but one. Do not look at me, Miss Strange. It was dishonoring to us both, and I am horrified now when I think of it. But to me, at that time, it was natural enough as a last resort. There was but one debt which my wife ever paid, but one promise she ever kept. It was that made at the gaming table. I offered as soon as my father, realizing the hopelessness of the situation, had gone tottering from the room, to gamble with her for the child. And she accepted. The shame and humiliation expressed in this final whisper, the sudden darkness, for a storm was coming up, shook Violet to the soul. With strained gaze fixed on the man before her, 
now little more than a shadow in the prevailing gloom, she waited for him to resume, and waited in vain. The minutes passed. The darkness became intolerable, and instinctively her hand crept towards the electric button beneath which she was sitting. But she failed to press it. A tale so dark called for an atmosphere of its own kind. She would cast no light upon it. Yet she shivered as the silence continued, and started in uncontrollable dismay when at length her strange visitor rose, and still without speaking, walked away from her to the other end of the room, only so he could go on with the shameful tale, and presently she heard his voice once more in these words. Our house is large, and its rooms many, but for such work as we two contemplated there was but one spot where we could command absolute seclusion. You may have heard of it. A famous natural grotto hidden in our own portion of the coast, and so fitted up as to form a retreat for our miserable selves when escape from my father's eyes seemed desirable. It was not easy of access, and no one, so far as we knew, had ever followed us there. But to ensure ourselves against any possible interruption, we waited till the whole house was abed before we left it for the grotto. We went by boat and— Oh, the dip of those oars! I hear them yet and the witchery of her face in the moonlight, and the mockery of her low, fitful laugh. As I caught the sinister note in its silvery rise and fall, I knew what was before me if I failed to retain my composure. And I strove to hold it, and meet her calmness with stoicism, and the taunt of her expression with a mask of immobility. But the effort was hopeless, and when the time came for dealing out the cards, my eyes were burning in their sockets, and my hands shivering like leaves in a rising gale. We played one game, and my wife lost. We played another, and my wife won. We played the third, and the fate I had foreseen from the first became mine. The luck was with her, and I had lost my boy. A gasp, a pause during which the thunder spoke and the lightning flashed. Then a hurried catching of his breath, and the tale went on. A burst of laughter rising gaily above the boom of the sea announced her victory. Her laugh and the taunting words, You play badly, Roger. The child is mine. Never fear that I shall fail to teach him to revere his father. Had I a word to throw back? No. When I realized anything but my dishonored manhood, I found myself in the grotto's mouth, staring helplessly out upon the sea. The boat which had floated us in at high tide lay stranded but a few feet away. But I did not reach for it. Escape was quicker over the rocks, and I made for the rocks that it was a cowardly act to leave her there to find her way back alone at midnight, but the same rough road I was taking did not strike my mind for an instant. I was in flight from my own past, in flight from myself and the haunting dread of madness. When I awoke to reality again, it was to find the small door by which we had left the house standing slightly ajar. I was troubled by this, for I was sure of having closed it, but the impression was brief, and entering, I went stumbling up to my room, leaving the way open behind me more from sheer inability to exercise my will than from any thought of her. Miss Strange. He had come out of the shadows and was standing now directly before her. I must ask you to trust implicitly in what I tell you of my further experiences that fatal night. It was not necessary for me to pass my little son's door in order to reach the room I was making for, but anguish took me there, and held me glued to the panels for what seemed a long, long time. When I finally crept away, it was to go to the room I had chosen in the top of the house, where I had my hour of hell and faced my desolated future. Did I hear anything meantime in the halls below? No. Did I even listen for the sound of her return? No. I was callous to everything, dead to everything but my own misery. I did not even heed the approach of morning, till suddenly, with a th shrillness no ear could ignore, there rose, tearing through the silence of the house, the great scream from my wife's room, which announced the discovery of her body lying stark and cold in her bed. They said I showed a little feeling. He moved off again and spoke from somewhere in the shadows. Do you wonder at this after such a manifest stroke by a benevolent providence? My wife being dead, Roger was saved to us. It was the one song of my still undisciplined soul, and I had to assume coldness, lest they should see the greatness of my joy. 
a wicked and guilty rejoicing you will say and you are right but i had no memory then of the part i had played in this fatality i had forgotten my reckless flight from the grotto which left her no aid but that of her own triumphant spirit to help her over those treacherous rocks the necessity for keeping secret this part of our disgraceful story led me to exert myself to keep it out of my own mind it has only come back to me in all of its force since a new horror a new suspicion has driven me to review carefully every incident of that awful night i was never a man of much logic and when they came to me on that morning of which i have just spoken and took me to where she lay and pointed to her beautiful cold body stretched out in seeming peace under the satin coverlet and then to the pile of dainty clothes lying neatly folded on a chair which is one fairy slipper on top i shuddered at her fate but asked no questions not even when one of the women of the house mentioned the circumstances of the single slipper and said that a search should be made for its maid nor was i as much impressed as one would naturally expect by the whisper dropped in my ear that something was the matter with her wrists it is true that i lifted the lace they had carefully spread over them and examined the discoloration which extended like a ring about each pearly arm but having no memories of any violence offered her i had not so much as laid a hand upon her in the grotto these marks failed to rouse my interest but and now i must leap a year in my story there came a time when both of these facts recurred to my mind with startling distinctness and clamoured for explanation End of Problem 4 The Grotto Spectre Part 1